just say your name and if you're connected to a farm or other wire here, you're not active at all. Start over there. I'm Shay. Jason. Uh, we just started Loping Bears Farm in Ventress, Louisiana in um, I'm Chris. I'm the farm manager at Crystal and Stamen, which is like a quarter mile that way on the same property. Um, and it's sort of just getting built out. Hi, I'm Olive, and I'm inspiring. I'm Layla. I work at Sugar Ridge Farm, which is in Hi, I'm Carl Matsubacher, professor of sustainable agriculture at LSU. Hey, everybody. I'm Marcus. I'm with LSU. Uh, I'm Kyle. I'm an apprentice here at River Queen Greens. I'm Christian. I'm also at River Queen Greens. I'm Chelsea, and I'm an apprentice here as well. Well, I think we might have a couple other people join, and one person ended up in AMA. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go! Uh, there's GPS's. <laughs> there's a lot of river roads around here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, mm. Michael. Probably our biggest 
kind of like year-round pests. Um, but I, I find that they are often cite, both cited as strategies for similar pests. So we've gone the predation route, but I do know a lot of growers that use neem oil and, and like it. Otherwise, our other most common pesticide that we use is BT, and that is super effective on caterpillars. They do have to ingest it before it works on them, so we try to only apply it uh, if they're not going to be getting the rain for a couple of days, so it gives the time to, you know, be attractive enough for a, a, a pest to eat it. Um, I brought out our kit over here. This is our pest kit. Not a whole lot.
it all in the tank. Um, you can't mix everything in the tank. There, you know, I would read the label and make sure it'll tell you what not to mix with, but we have mixed all three of our tools in the tank, which is great. So they do one pass. Really. Is the clay good for soft bodied and like beetly things? The clay is is great just as a deterrent. It doesn't it doesn't actually like kill anything. Um, but before so if we had like an infestation of of worms, like we might use a mixture of the BT and the clay so that the BT would kill the worms and the clay would ideally um, prevent future interest. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's definitely not like the most effective, you know, certainly an actual killing pesticide would be more effective, but it's, it's kind of like the strategies so this is kind of like you're gonna get a little look inside my brain which is you know still constantly learning so I'm looking at this and I'm like hmm, is this a disease all diseases to me kind of look the same they're all they all create this like yellow decaying dying leaves um, some of them are a lot more severe and we'll permeate the whole plant. Some of them I feel like just kind of hang out on the outer leaves. Um, is these, did this show up after the storm? This? No. Yeah, the yellow. The other thing is that we have had tons of aphids in these watermelon radishes, which is what this crop is. But, and so a lot of this damage, when I first saw it, I was like, that's probably aphids because we started just clearing and topping everything because the leaves were infested. Um, but I'm not seeing them now. They may have been blown off in the storm or gotten washed away in the storm because I haven't seen as many since then. And we didn't spray these. We have sprayed other crops, but like I'm not growing watermelon radishes for their green, so I don't really mind so much. They're all pretty mature at this point. They're kind of just hanging out in the soil. So I don't mind so much if their leaves start to get weird, as long as it doesn't affect the root. Um, so when I saw aphids, it just meant we stopped bunting them and we started topping them. But this could also be some kind of leaf spot, which is a common like fungal disease that affects probably everything we grow. If you look at the disease sheet, the conditions that disease is like is is like high humidity, wet conditions. <laughs> so it's a miracle that, you know, fungus doesn't doesn't just take over the whole farm. Because like when do we I mean this is kind of a nice dry spell but even still our soil maintains pretty high level of moisture. So you know it feels dry to us but our friends from other places still come here and think that right now it's super humid. So we're just, we're, we live in a high humidity climate. It breeds disease. Our strategy is just like, I'm obsessed with pruning our plants. Like, like anytime we're harvesting something, like a kale, I'm always trying to take off any yellowing and dying leaves. Just get them out of there, increase airflow, and um, let the plant focus on the healthy leaves and not try to save these leaves that are already dead or dying. So that's like, that's my number one strategy for disease. Like I don't have any fungicides. We haven't yet started preventative spraying of fungicides, which um, I would consider that for, for tomatoes. I haven't had success growing tomatoes in the, because of pests. Like not like they don't even get to a point where they can get a fungal disease because the pests get them first. So I'm waiting until we can put up, or we're getting some caterpillar tunnels this winter, and I'm waiting to put those up, and then maybe I'll try growing tomatoes again. Tomatoes is the one thing that I'm just like, I hate growing them. I like eating them fine, but I don't like them enough to really want to suffer through growing them here. Um, they're hard enough to grow in the north. 
where they do eventually succumb to late flight pretty much every year at this point. <coughs> common pest but they're kind of everywhere all the time for us but like not you know we they're easy to find but they're not like so destructive that I really care about them something like that you could deal with you could um, use like a sluggo I don't know if that actually works on snails the best thing for snails is ducks but I'm not gonna bring it up in here because you know <laughs> safety I would love to, so I love cool. ducks. <laughs> but again, if you have an orchard and you have a snail problem, get your ducks in there. Um, so yeah, I feel like I don't really care about the watermelon radish. They're fine. We had aphids, but they seem to be gone. When you do prune and you have like fungus and stuff, do you compost it or drop it on the ground or are you try to separate it? Um, I usually we haven't had any like super super bad widespread fungal disease so i'll just drop it on the ground or put it in our ditch or these thin stitches at the ends of our bed so that's where all of our plant matter goes right now um we're not the compost that we add to these beds is not from things that we're making so it i don't get it that far away but it doesn't go back in the bed unless i'm just dropping it in which case it's in the pathway um, yeah, I could probably be better about about being more careful when there is a fungal disease. But I'm kind of like, this is all, it's all just leaf spot. Or, you know, I'm always like, it all just looks like these moderate kind of diseases that we just live with in this climate. And it's not until something is like really overtaken that I start to worry about like, okay, where am I putting this? Um, but something like this I wouldn't worry about. Like we'll just leave it in the pathway and then we'll tarp it once these beds are all clear. And you know, tarping has the effect also of cooking a lot of that. I don't know the particular science for, around like what temperature the tarps get to. It would be really interesting actually to kind of test that. Like how hot does the soil get in the summer? I bet it gets pretty hot. And, our, uh, some of our friends who grow in Mississippi actually think that it gets too hot to kill off. So they're dealing more with like tarps for weed control, which we are too, but, um, but they're actually speculating if it gets too hot to kill the weeds because they think it might actually just like go dormant and because they were seeing flushes right after they pulled up the tarp. It's kind of interesting. That's not science that I've really gotten into. Um, all right, well, I'm fine with the watermelon radish. Let's see what else we can find. Oh. I'm starting to get really concerned about these. Um, these they like the Amara a lot. These yes. are Harlequin stink bugs. Stink bugs are, can also be green, brown, tan, but they have this like shield shaped body. Um, we have a ton of these. Yeah, we just cleared some mustard greens that they really, really like. And uh, we can head that way and you'll see what they've been doing to them. They just take these little, little bites that just kind of like start to stress out the leaves and they get real pockmarked. This is a really great example of stink bug damage. We just cleared this crop, which like I'm probably going to somewhat regret because it was kind of acting as a trap crop. Um, but you can see like they just poke all of these holes, gets these kind of like dried up brown spots in the leaves. It ends up stressing the leaves uh, very prematurely. They start to look like this. So we end up having to prune 
like Chelsea has been bunching these for our past few harvests and having to prune like half the plant off because they end up like this. Um, they, you can use pyrethrin on them. I've never, I've never done that because like they fly, they bounce around, like they're kind of just hard to get in one place. So I don't want to have to come through and like, like be chasing it around with the, with the backpack sprayer. Um, they've never been that bad. Like even, they were bad on this crop, but we still managed to get a harvest off of them. Just the wheat, you know, you kind of have to like be more aggressive when harvesting and get it before they kind of make it unmarketable. Um, it wasn't like the most beautiful stuff, but after pruning it, it looked, it looked really nice still. And you know, you're going to cook it and eat it. You're not going to look at it. So, um, I'm not that, like, I like to, to sell really nice vegetables, but I'm not trying to give a false illusion either that our vegetables are going to be really uniform and perfect. Like I want, I want our customers to understand the kind of challenges we face here in South Louisiana. So I'm fine with holes in our greens as long as it's not like half the greenness as well as holes. Um, people also tend to like, they're like, oh, that's really not nice organic. volunteers that want to come pick chicken <laughs> snacks <laughs> it's a great a great activity for kids yeah. like um you know i've definitely spent a lot of time with volunteer groups picking picking like colorado potato beetles off of potatoes like these kinds of really uh really beautiful kind of like easy to spot pests mm -hmm. can be a really fun group activity so don't don't underestimate it um, i have a question yeah um, what is your, I know you said you were thinking that you should have left this as a trap crop. Do you guys have any kind of like systematic practice with like trap crops or beneficials or like what is the balance? I've been thinking a lot on our farm. What is the balance between like leaving habitat for beneficial insects, but sometimes that habitat is also hosting your pests mm -hmm. and like how do you figure <coughs> that out? Um, that's a great question and something we are also considering. So, I've never intentionally planted a trap crop um, because I've always, we've never had a ton of space. Like, we're, having, we're getting more and more space here as we build out, so now would be a time to start thinking about that. But I've never wanted to sacrifice, like, intentionally go in and be like, okay, I'm not going to harvest this bed, I'm just going to try and funnel all of my beetles to it or something. And, and I don't know how effective it is. I, um, Dr. A actually, he, he's a good person to ask about trap crops. He has a lot of opinions about them and, and specific varieties for specific crops, which is interesting. I think if you're going to do it, you really want to research like what's going to be the most attractive or just observe. Like now I feel like, okay, Amara, that's the, this variety of mustard green, like this is going to be a really attractive crop trap crop to stink bugs so we could you know plant it I've, I've seen people say like you want to plant it like every seventh bed or something if you have like a half acre but it's like what does that translate to if you just have like three beds is it like could I just put like one plant every 10 feet or something yeah. so there's some like calculating to do to try to really use the knowledge that's out there to your advantage because if it doesn't work, then you're just then you're just attracting pests that are just yeah. gonna like spill over the rest of your crops. Yeah. Kind of like piggyback off what you just said, because you kind of like plant trap crops in like an in bed, like kind of like an in cap. Like you'd have a whole bed, but say this bitch wasn't here, right? If you mm -hmm. did like a little half bed at the end. Yeah. You, 
plant trap crops too. Yes, I think that's I think that's a better strategy. For, like that's what I'm more attracted to, and not necessarily a trap crop, but to kind of go back to what you're saying, Layla. I think I think having pollinator habitat is probably like one of the most important pest management strategies. Um, because it attracts such a diversity of pollinators and a lot of these pesticides are not toxic to pollinators. I would double check. Uh, I know like BT is not. Gigantic I think is if you hit the pollinator, so just but so you're but it's on contact, so like you kind of just have to be strategic around um, your management strategy and if you like the idea of a trap trap is like you gather them all in one place and then you still do kill them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like that they hang out on that trap trap forever because then you're just like growing their population. But I think um, if like if we had a pollinator habitat and I found that it was getting kind of infested, I would probably go through with an organic pesticide just to try to like knock back that population and try to um, encourage the flourishing of the predators. Um, something that a lot of a lot of gardeners and growers will do is they'll and we've done this in the past too is you can buy predators, you can buy ladybugs, you can buy lace wings. But parasitic wasps. You can buy I don't can you buy a parasitic wasp? Probably you can buy a die for the yeah, oh yeah, we did buy parasitic wasps. But the thing is, like, predators, especially ladybugs, like, they're so, um, like, endemic to their, like, native space. So, I find that buying ladybugs has not actually ever worked out because they just leave. They're, like, this isn't their home. And don't they, like, collect them in, like, the mountains on the west coast somewhere and, like, ship them to us? I thought that was so funny. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely, they collect them where they're prolific and then they get here and they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't, I didn't, I wasn't raised here. I don't know if I'm this climate. So, so, I feel like we've gotten, you know, like thousands of ladybugs. And after like a day, I see like half a dozen eating aphids and it's just like, this ratio is not working out. You know, so I think the best thing that you can do is attract your own ladybugs, and that that is by being really intentional about pollinator habitat. And also, when talking, when thinking about habitat, like we don't have a ton of rodent or like small mammal pests, fortunately. But um, part of that could be because we have really great snake habitat here, and we also have hawks and you know. Kind of a lot of aerial activity but there's a lot to be said for like leaving some of your field edges overgrown and kind of like letting that native habitat just be a great cover for some of these predators because like i'm obsessed with mowing i love mowing i love a clean border but i also that that works in tension with my understanding that like habitat and overgrowth it can be a really good thing too. So I think just kind of keeping that in mind as you as you plan your fields, like you don't want to strip it of all life, you know? Like we want the balance, we want the life in there. We don't want to just like, I don't want super bare soil with no life in it. Because our plants need that life to thrive also. Cheryl, do you have some favorites like in terms of plants that you would, that you would put that would attract pollinators and kind of be like beneficial support? Um, any, I mean, any native flowering plant is great. Um, if you're going to be doing like, if you're going to be cover cropping at the same time that you're growing stuff, you know, if you're cover cropping a certain area, like buckwheat does really well here for most of the year. Like it, it grows really fast and it flowers and you'll probably see some scattered around our fields that's left over from summer. Buckwheat is just like a really great attractor of bees and other pollinators, like marigolds, calendula, phastelia is a flower that I've seen come up a lot as a really great pollinator and like predator attractor. 
them. So, so any of those, like, if you're trying to really specifically attract certain predators, like ladybugs or lacewings or um, some beetles, then just I would just look up like zone nine, which is our zone, like you know what's like the most attractive thing for uh, these these insects here. But really, there's anything flowering. A, there's also a really there's a nice um, nursery called Delta Flora, and they do like all native plants, um, and they might know like more pollinator specific stuff. And it's also just like a really cool local business. Where they where they located? Um, where is it again? It's on like Turbo. Is it like the seventh ward? Or yeah. Something? It's close to the Lowe's, um, yeah. off of the Legion. Mm -hmm. Delta Central Flora. Central, Central mm -hmm. Lowe's, but they have weird hours to look at. Yeah. I saw they were selling at the uh, Refresh Market. Whole Foods or not at Whole Foods. They're on the corner from Whole Foods. Hey Sarah. Mm -hmm. Is the white fabric just about heat, or does it have anything to do with pests? The white fabric. Because the, these four beds of landscape fabric, ignore the, the baby kales and the collards coming up, because those are replacement crops for what was initially planted here, which was four beds of Swiss chard, which got immediately attacked by armyworms. And you can see what armyworms do. They totally skeletonize the plant. They leave a disgusting mess. Um, and they do it really quickly. They like they really do come in like a little army and annihilate everything in sight. Our Swiss chard didn't even make it out of the greenhouse. They ate it really as a transplant. <laughs> so I've been we've been farming here now for three years. And every fall I try to to grow Swiss chard and beets. And I don't know why I keep trying to because the army worms love those two, that family of crops this time of year. And I think we just planted another round uh, in the, our new field over there. And I immediately had Kyle go and spray surround and BT on it as a preventative spray, which I don't usually do, knowing that they'll probably find it soon. And fingers crossed, it still looks okay. But with, that's the third planting of Swiss chard we've done this, this fall. The second planting, we filled in the holes here, and I also sprayed it, but not right away. And all these empty holes, that's the result of our second planting. <laughs> and they... We didn't have to clear up. We didn't have to clear up. They, <laughs> they create, like, now it's ready to plant again. So I don't know what I'm looking at here. Probably more kales, because they don't love... Like, they really just love this stem labor this time of year. I mean, the, the army worms come in many shapes and sizes. I put a few examples on here, but they have like 10 different names, like feet armyworms, African armyworms, tall armyworms, cabbage loopers, which are more attractive to the cabbage. But our, like, in the fall, the armyworms are one of our biggest pests. They've also done this to the beets. Luckily we got some beets out of them, and, and like beets again is something we can just top. But we still need those leaves for the plant to photosynthesize. So it's like, if we can get the beets to grow before they find it, then finally lose the greens, which is sad, but not the end of the world. But a lot of times they'll get there before the, the plant has really formed. And so that's just a total crop loss. So I don't really, I don't know if like, if we just didn't plant these, would they attack something else in another family? I don't really know, because I'm just like, forget each year that we shouldn't plant them. <laughs> but maybe it's okay because it's just a trap crop that I was not intending to have. Um, but they, but like, so in the spring, the army worms also, they love tomatoes and will cover the tomato fruit, the plant, everything. They're just disgusting. Um, I mean, it's one of just many things that love tomatoes. But yeah, there's like, I don't know, I guess some stuff is coming back here. I haven't seen lots of evidence of them. They don't seem to like the cold weather as much. So 
we can, I think next year I'll probably wait until October to plant my chard. This, the first round of chard went in in August, the second round went in in September, the third round went in in October, and we'll see if the third round makes it. Could you put the DE in the soil, like you, in a bed you knew you were going to transplant something that army worms like? Could you put the DE in the soil, or would that be something that would be... Maybe. I've never heard of that, but you could maybe do that. Um, you mean like for the moths, or for like when they lay the eggs and the eggs kind of come out into this... For the, when they lay the eggs. Lay. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to like top dress like a bed, kind of? Top dress it before you transplant it, maybe. Project. About a year. Similar to the watermelon radish, but these I don't think had aphids, or, or I haven't seen them. I think it's very possible they've been in here. But um, our friend Margie, who's also a farmer and a, a very knowledgeable grower, thought that it was white fly damage. It's like you can, you can see if we're hitting it that there are some 
some kind of bug jumping up. So it's very possible that it's white fly. I also do whatever. I haven't seen the actual white flies themselves. So it could just be kind of like sporadic white fly over time because again, we, I haven't been paying that close attention to this bed. It's another, it's daikon radish, so it's I'm growing it for the roots again, so I'm not I'm not obsessing over the greens as much as I do other crops. Um, but if it is white fly, like this damage is consistent with that, but but this damage could be the result of other things as well. But white flies kind of like come in and suck out the juice. And so you end up with these like dehydrated leaves that start to like crumble and wilt and die. And theoretically if left long enough, like it could affect the whole plant, it could potentially end up rotting the whole plant. But I've never seen, I've never personally had white fly damage to the extent that it actually affected, like in a root crop that it actually affected the root. So I'm not that concerned about them. Um, they, they're similar to um, something I used to see a lot in the north, which was leaf hopper, which is just a very similar, like invisible pest that you don't see until you hit it, and then you see this whole cloud of pests jump up. And they also just like dehydrate the plant, and, and they they actually I find I have found those to be much more destructive. Like they could destroy a whole potato crop because you kind of don't see them coming but there are so many of them and then they, like overnight they just like push them up and brown the whole plant and uh, a lot of times that happens early in the life cycle of the potato so a lot of times it's hard for the, the plants to bounce back and, and photosynthesize again um, but like I'm not I'm not that concerned similar to the watermelon radish that's kind of in the same category for me where it's like if if this is about all they're doing, I'm fine with that. I'm happy to leave them be. In your career, have you had any issue with like uh, white powdery mildew or black spot and things like that? Um, I mean, I've definitely had those be very present, but I've never had seasons. I mean, we've had we've had weather seasons where like it was more of an issue. It, it really affected our uh, cucumber and squash yeah, planting. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's very susceptible. Yeah, so there's some info about that on the disease chart, and that's a really common disease, fungal disease that hits um, that the cucurbit family, and it's kind of like I've seen it. I've mostly seen it towards the end of the life cycle of the plant. Yeah. It's harder on those longer winter squash plants because they're in the ground so much longer. But for us, what we were mostly growing was um, summer squash and cucumbers, which are much faster, and we would just grow successions of them, knowing that eventually they would probably succumb to one of the mildews, which just kind of browns and wilts the whole plant, and the fruit production totally stops or starts to rot. So it's kind of something like, like I, I kind of have have understood as I've learned about farming that eventually your plant is gonna get like you're kind of just in a race with either the disease or the pest or just the weather. So if you want a consistent supply, you gotta like do a lot of successions and just a lot of plantings and kind of just stack your skills higher than theirs to get enough of the return that you want. But I feel like everything ultimately gets in these wet climates. Like everything ultimately gets a disease, if not eaten by a pest, or if it's left too long. Do you know anything that helps? Because I usually use like copper fungicide, but I just want want the dandy to go. Yeah, copper is good. Um, what else on here? It's harder. Yeah. So like I. I, I was reading something, someone said apple cider vinegar is good. Yeah, Chris? Um, for really high value crops, we use potassium uh, bicarbonate, which is an organic chemical. That you, or you can buy an organic and non organic, but the organic one is very expensive. It's called Green Pure, C U R E. And we use it on really high value flower crops to just slow down how quickly the powdery mildew will kill them. We plant a lot of crops that are not.
Basil, that, the reason it's been so bad for us this year is because we were using old seed that was not actually uh, disease resistant. So I would look, if you're buying seed, like it's always worth checking its disease resistance. A lot of uh, food gang has been focusing on fungal disease, so you can find a lot of varieties that are more resistant. And we have grown better basil with more resistant seed. And I'm always, I'm always kind of skeptical about like the gizmos on seed. usually don't like things like this, right? They it's not their preferred diet, but I guess they'll eat it if they're actually not So yeah, you can pick around here. Earthway would be really tough to get through our heavy clay. 
would, I would, I would spray BT for these um, if we find that before the cabbage is heading out they're becoming a real issue. I don't mind a couple of plants having them, but I don't want, I don't want all of our cabbage, all of our customers to open up their cabbage and find. Yeah, you can, um, I think it requires, so yeah, you can certainly use the clay to, um, be a, like, if you have a tray that you're about to transplant, you can create a clay mixture and dunk the whole thing, but it requires more water and, uh, I think a heavier concentration of clay to get it to stick to that, so it's really just kind of a preference, like, for us, we... We'll sometimes just spray the clay, but oftentimes we're spraying the clay in conjunction with something else. Um, at least this fall has been the clay and the Pygamic or BT or both. Um, as, as the spring heats up into summer, that's more when we are spraying the clay more just for like the sun protection if we're getting a lot of particularly blazing hot days. I don't know, I'm kind of mixed on whether I like to dunk the tray or spray. The spray is just like more direct, but the dunk is a lot more efficient if you can get that good contact with the clay. And the clay does not have the same kind of method as, uh, of operation as like diatomaceous earth, right? It's not, not really the same. You mean like if it rains? Or like just sort of like how it's effective. I mean, it's like a deterrent, but it's not killing them, right? The yeah. Diatomaceous earth is a killing. B does kill something like some really soft body things because it's so like spiky, uh -huh. you know. Um, but I think it also acts as a deterrent because like walking on broken glass for a lot of insects, like right around the plant base. Okay. So it kind of depends on the insect. The clay, the clay will not kill anything. So right. DE, I think, will kill some of those like smaller, softer bodies. To your point, they do, do they wash away in the rain? But they will wash away in the rain. I mean, the, the residue of the clay, like even after a rain, will stick a little bit, but um, it's not harmful to humans, so, you know, and it, it does keep diluting with water. Yeah, Christian? With the BT being a bacteria that lives in, like, the soil, does it have to be, like, sprayed on it, or can you just put it in the soil? Uh, well, you want to, you can put it in the soil. It kind of depends what pest you're trying to get at. If you're aiming for a pest that's really like eating your leaves, then you want to spray it on the leaves so that the worm will actually ingest it. Um, but there are like cutworms is a common pest that just kind of eats through the stem of the plant right below the soil surface. So in that case, putting it right around the plant at the soil could be very effective. I've never personally done that with cutworms because an alternate cutworm strategy is just to put a solo cup around the plant, which is a physical collar, and that's actually very effective. And I've mostly had cutworm issues with plants that are uh, bigger, like tomatoes or peppers, things that there aren't that many plants, so it's not that difficult to place a barrier around each of them, rather than um, spreading the powder around each is there any negative like effects of like if you were to do that, like put the BT back in the soil? I mean it's already probably like in the soil, so I guess you know. I don't think so. I mean it's um 
it also, you know, kind of washes away and then leaves in the rain. I think it's not, it's not in the soil in such a concentration that is effective for, um, like, like, just in a natural state. So I think, like, having this concentrated amount that you target to where that pest is actually munching on, I think that's what makes it a really effective pesticide. <coughs> The last thing I'll say before we start walking around is I included the phone number of Dr. Ayanava Majandar from um, Auburn University. I did a, I w uh, attended a presentation he did at the conference where he just said to text him a photo of any pest damage you have and he'll text you back a recommendation or an identification what it is and what to do and just so I've used him a lot to kind of like parse out between two pests that I was suspecting or to ask him like is it okay to mix these things in a tank he's super responsive he usually responds within a couple hours he doesn't care who you are <laughs> just say like where you're coming what zone you're in so I'll be like hey it's Cheryl from New Orleans is this yellow margin leaf beetle or the flea beetle or the grasshopper what do you think? And what do we do? Um, so that's been really fun. He's, uh, he's very knowledgeable. So, uh, Dr. Matsutaka was saying that you might be able to get him. Yeah. yeah, he actually was here. We did a training about two years ago. He came over and did a day long training. Cool. And he has those cards. He has a push card that has all that information. It's really a handy guy throughout in the field. Remember yeah. we had those last year? We mm -hmm. have one of those on our, on our bench training. So, and he. Website. He gives those out too. He has funding for that. So we'll, we can see if we can try to bring them here, but also have them bring those cards to give out to people because they're really useful. Yeah, yeah, those cards, it's like probably has most of what I have on here, if not everything. And um, it's probably more general info, which is good for both applications. Yeah, he's, he's a great resource if you do get them down here. Yeah, he's also doing work on shade to exclude insects in high tones. Yes. Which is really very like top notch work. Yeah. I don't know anybody else that's, that's doing this. Yeah. That's yeah, I didn't even want to go into that because that's a whole other ball game of managing pests in your high tunnels. Especially on things like tomatoes, which is often why people get up in the middle. Um okay, so I thought we could just walk around and kind of look to see if we can find some pests. That we can, um, or just identify things that look weird or wrong with our plants, and maybe we can figure out what it is. Uh, yeah. Little experiment about heat. It didn't really work because you can see in some of these par parts of the bed it doesn't actually kill the weeds underneath. Like in the spring, it was actually like a grass. Like it's kind of just, it's, it's just like a greenhouse right now. Maybe. Was he 
burn. Yeah, it is. It's it, like it a melts light. very differently. It's, it's more just, lighter. It's just a thicker grade. Mm. I, I think it's thinner. Yeah, actually. It's a different. It's, it's, a, like, it's a different. It's like it's a plastic kind of plastic. It's like plastic instead of more like cloth. That's cute. This is actually That's more nice. tarp material that you would. You can take it all. That's the soft part. There's some pretty, these are hard. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about all these pots. Like, yeah. so many of them are so beautiful. I don't feel that way about the army. Right? When you burn it, it, oh, no, it looks like melting marshmallows. Yeah, it's like these little stuff. Let's see these little blobs of it. Speaking of army there, let's go check out some army work, Dan.